All right, can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right, uh, thank you all for coming to the afternoon session. Um, my name is Matt Hummond. I'll be telling you about work uh, that we're doing in John Kitchen Group at NIST, um, specifically working on uh, uh, using a photonic chip for laser stabilization to iridium atomic vapor. And this work is done in collaboration uh, with uh, groups at uh, NIST in Gaithersburg at the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology, uh, in particular Kartik Srinivasan and Vladimir Axio, uh, lead the groups that do the fabrication uh, of our photonic chips. Um, I'd also like to thank Scott Didims uh, at NIST Boulder uh, for uh, help and uh, loan of a frequency cone uh, in order to characterize our, our photonic chip laser stabilization technique. All right, so a brief outline of my talk. I'd first give you a, a motivation for um, our photonic chip setup, uh, in particular how it relates to a program called NIST on a chip. Um, I'll then give a design uh, um, layout of our uh, photonic chip design and assembly, uh, and then I'll show our laser stabilization setup and, and results. So uh, part of uh, NIST on a chip's mission and core company, competencies is uh, to support uh, measurement science and uh, develop and uh, uh, really push for, forward metrology science. And so um, to this end, uh, one of the programs that we're working on is, is called NIST on a Chip. And the idea is to, to take um, all of the calibration services that NIST has for any particular SI unit, whether it be the volt or uh, temperature or time or length, and, and miniaturize this, much in the same way that uh, John Kitchen Groups did earlier with the, the CSAC. And so um, while it'd be nice to have, have every SI unit on a single chip, uh, our focus uh, for this talk will just be on uh, a link unit, um, specifically stabilizing the wavelength of a laser. And we'll do this uh, um, by taking advantage of uh, uh, photonic structures to, to miniaturize this uh, and be able to have it um, using a rubidium atomic vapor to make it self-calibrating uh, and using MEMS technology to make it low cost and compact. So um, I won't say too much about uh, photonic chips and, and atomic vapors since Liron gave a nice introduction to them in his talk just a minute ago. So, um, there are lots of other platforms uh, done by many groups, uh, including Atomic Cloud Waveguides, uh, Arrows, Holocore Photonic Fibers. Um, and you'll notice in all of these, the light is confined to a mode on the order of a micron, maybe a little bit more in some case, maybe a little bit, little bit less in other case. And one advantage to combining it to such a small mode volume is you get very strong atom-light interactions. And that can be great for uh, things where you want to do two photon transitions with a few photons or, or do optical switching with few photons. For us, uh, we're doing metrology. We want very weak atom light interactions. And so uh, a lot of what we're figuring out is, is how do we uh, take advantage of the integrations given by photonics, but take that light, get it out of these very small mode volumes so that we can very weakly probe our atoms so that we don't perturb uh, the atomic transition frequency so that we can end up with a nice, uh, very narrow line with stabilization setup. So uh, to that end, um, here's a, a cartoon drawing of, of our photonic chip. Um, it's based on a silicon nitride waveguide, much like uh, many of the other techniques. Uh, that's shown here. Uh, we couple laser light in um, from optical fibers for now uh, into these silicon nitride leg uh, waveguides via um, a tapered waveguide mode matching technique here. Um, at the end of the waveguide, uh, we go into a beam expander that expands the beam up to somewhere on the order of a few microns, up to 10 microns, and then we have a, a, a grating etched in the silicon, silicon nitride here that diffracts portion of the light from the waveguide up vertically out of the plane of the photonic chip uh, through a rubidium vapor, and then uh, we can detect that light up on a photodiode placed above our photonic chip. Yeah. So the um, question is, uh, 
we want to miniaturize this. Uh, what's the natural length scale for miniaturization uh, of this technique? So uh, what's shown here is, is cell size in millimeters on this axis and uh, line width of a laser transition we're trying to stabilize to. And then this uh, line here uh, gives the, the velocity of uh, thermal rubidium vapor, 300 meters per second. And so if you're below this line, um, your, your transit time through your cell is going to limit uh, the uh, line width that you'll achieve. And so you, we want to be on, on, on this side of the, this line. So you can see uh, for evidences and fields like Liron talked about, you'll, you'll end up with sort of gigahertz uh, line widths. And so uh, for the alkali vapors, uh, a typical Doppler free line is on the order of megahertz, a few megahertz. And so, or you can go to narrower two photon transitions down to hundreds of kilohertz. So that puts us in a cell size on the order of a millimeter to 100 microns. And so this, uh, this length scale is what we'll be focusing on. Um, and uh, it's convenient um, uh, for uh, um, this length scale is, is well uh, suited for mem cell fabrication. Um, and uh, so our goal is to get our, our laser light from the sort of uh, micron wavelength guiding scale up to these sort of 100 micron uh, size scale so that we can uh, probe our atoms without uh, perturbing them too much. So um, Kartik and, uh, and Vladimir uh, fabricate these waveguides for us on four inch wafers, um, silicon nitride on silicon substrate base. Uh, you can see here on the right, uh, there are waveguides here that come around like this and then uh, go on to these grating structures that send the light up, up out of the chip. Um, so they can make a, a whole four inch wafer and dice these chips into um, small sort of nine by 14 millimeter size chips. Um, so the next step is once they give us these chips, we, uh, we need to get the rubidium atoms into the chip. And so uh, we use a technique that was developed by a uh, group at FEMTOST where you can um, put a small uh, rubidium uh, alkali metal dispenser pill inside uh, your, your rubidium, your photonic chip uh, you can then place uh, your chip uh, in a vacuum chamber, pump it down to very low pressures, 10 to the minus 8 torr, uh, and then we do a nodic bonding where we uh, bond a Pyrex glass slide on top of this to seal off the chamber, and then remove the uh, photonic chip from the chamber, and using a, a one watt laser focused down onto the, the, the dispenser pill, we can heat it up to a few hundred degrees C's, and that uh, dispenses rubidium into the the photonic chamber here. So these white dots that you see on, on top here are uh, actually rubidium droplets that have liquefied to the top Pyrex window. Um, so you can see we can uh, get rubidium in the chambers and still have access to our, our waveguides and gratings on the right here. Um, to do our spectroscopy, um, we typically heat our cells up to about 100 degrees C. So uh, the photonic chip is shown right here. Uh, it's placed on a, an aluminum base plate that we heat uh, up to about 100 C. The uh, fiber array waveguide is uh, brought in to the right. Um, we can put this on a translation stage and optimize the coupling of the fiber array light uh, into the uh, photonic waveguides. This is just a loopback waveguide that allows us to optimize our coupling. Typically, uh, we can get about uh, 9 dB loss round trip through this uh, fiber to waveguide back to fiber uh, transition. So that's about 5 dB per facet that we can get um, using the tapered fiber uh, technique. Um, so uh, just to remind you, uh, for the spectroscopy I'm going to show, the light comes in through the waveguides, goes off the grating, goes up through uh, the rubidium cell here, which is about 500 microns thick. And then we place a photodiode on top of the photonic chip to, to detect the transmitted probe laser light. So uh, this uh, was spectrum taken back uh, in November. Um, 
This is a, mi a microscope looking uh, at the, the photonic tip. You can see 780 nanometer laser light coming out of this upper grating. We can uh, scan the frequency of the, uh, the laser across the spectrum and uh, see uh, a Doppler broadened spectrum. Blue is a reference cell and uh, red is the photonic chip. So we have uh, both rubidium 85 and 87 in this chip and you can see those absorption features there. Um, just like to note that this uh, photonic cell is still operating today. We can still see subdoppler lines in it actually. It's, so it's been uh, working for eight months, um, uh, which uh, was answering one of the first questions uh, we had about these cells was could we make um, uh, these cells hermetically sealed? Um, the way they're manufactured is uh, the, the deposition is done up to this oxide layer and then we have this uh, half half millimeter thick silicon uh, layer that provides the, the cell for the rubidium that is fusion bonded on top of the nitride layer and there were some questions of whether that seal would be hermetic. So far to this point uh, we believe that the seal is, is hermetic uh, as we still have rubidium uh, in, in the cell eight months later. Um, so now I'll move on to our laser locking setup. Um, we uh, chose to go with a FM spectroscopy laser locking. So uh, we modulate the frequency of our laser at 30 megahertz by uh, dithering the, the current to a DBR laser. Uh, that gets coupled into a fiber, uh, goes through a 90-10 splitter, 10% goes to a frequency comb to, to monitor uh, heterodyne frequency. Uh, we then send it onto the photonic chip and monitor it with a photodiode. Um, we take the signal from the photodiode um, we look at the component at 30 megahertz and mix that down and do phase sensitive detective detection to get our error signal. Um, typical error signal is shown here and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, on the upper left is, is the error signal shown here uh, from our photonic chip and you can see uh, down here is the absorption profile and so this is a, a wide Doppler broadened absorption tip in the 85. And in the error signal, you can see subdoppler features here and here, and you can just barely make them out in the absorption profile. Um, to get these subdoppler peaks, you normally need some sort of pump beam to get uh, velocity-dependent pumping. Um, we think the pump beam is coming from a partial refraction off the top of our window, um, although we're not sure. Um, uh, we tried putting a partial reflector above uh, the mirror to get a stronger pump beam to increase the size of these peaks. Um, but have not been successful just due to the, the small sort of 10 to 20 micron mode size. It's hard to align and overlap that pump beam and retroreflection. Uh, in any case, we do have subdoppler features. They're, they're about 50 megahertz wide. Um, ideally, uh, um, if we had a, a good, strong uh, pump beam, we'd have subdoppler features look like this, where the slope of the subdoppler feature is much sharper than the broad Doppler uh, background. In this case, the slope of our subdoppler features is about as the same slope as our uh, Doppler feature right here, Doppler broaden feature. And so um, uh, we expect to get the same uh, locking stability performance for our, as if we locked our subdoppler peak to our Doppler peak. However, in the future, uh, we hope to be able to get a better retroreflected pump beam and make these subdoppler peaks sharper um, to, to get better uh, locking. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we can uh, fit the line widths of these uh, subdoppler peaks. They're about 50 megahertz. Uh, the natural line width of uh, the rubidium transition is uh, 6 megahertz. Um, we think this is uh, this residual broadening is mostly due to power broadening. Uh, shown here is a plot of the the broadening of the line versus uh, relative laser power. So it's a little noisy, but you can see there's definitely a trend of, of as we go to lower powers, the, the line narrows down to as low as uh, 40 megahertz. Um, so uh, now I'll, I'll talk about um, how we uh, characterize our, our laser locking stabilization. So we pick off 10% uh, of a, a light uh, from our system and send it to a frequency comb. Uh, it's a erbium fiber-based frequency comb at uh, 1550 nanometers, we uh, take a portion of the spectrum, pass it through a piplum crystal to double it, uh, and we get about a milliwatt of light at 795 nanometers um, uh, in a four nanometer bandwidth. Uh, 
We can combine that with uh, light from our 795 nanometer DBR that we stabilize uh, and monitor that on a fast photodiode. Um, uh, shown here is a typical beat note between our uh, DBR laser that we stabilize with a photonic chip and a comb tooth. Um, we get about 30 dB signal to noise, which is enough to count on a, a spectrum analyzer uh, using a frequency counter. Um, the line width here is on the order of about a megahertz. The spacing here uh, uh, is, a, is five megahertz per division. Um, so uh, here's uh, some of our first results uh, showing the performance of our DBR laser locked to our photonic chip. Um, the blue uh, trace here shows uh, the frequency of the DBR laser when it's locked. Um, as a function of time, it's over 500 seconds here. And so uh, the red trace is the free running DBR when it's not locked. And so you can see there's drift on the order of about 10 megahertz uh, when uh, the DBR is unlocked. Uh, you can convert these frequencies to an Allen deviation. Uh, we're about a few 10 to the minus 9 at a second, and it averages down a little bit, down to about 10 to the minus 9. And it stays at the 10 to the minus 9 level out to uh, 100 thousand seconds. Um, so uh, 10 to the minus 9 corresponds to a stability of about 400 kilohertz. So we're splitting our 50 megahertz lines by about a factor of 100 at the moment. Um, you can also lock to the Doppler broad lines. Um, so the vertical scale here is about the same as over here. And so you can see we don't quite lock as tightly when we lock to the Doppler broad lines. Um, but the, the Allen deviation is, is similar here. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this is expected since the, the slopes of our error signals for both the Doppler and sub-Doppler lines are, are similar. So, uh, so put this in context, where are we? So uh, this is sort of a, a Allen deviation plot of a bunch of different stabilization techniques. The unstabilized lasers up here at above 10 to the minus 9. You sort of have Doppler broadened stabilization through here, sub-Doppler, et cetera. Um, the goal for NIST on a chip is, is on the order of 10 to the minus 10 in a second, averaging down to 10 to the minus 11 level. Right now, we're, we're up here, so uh, uh, we think we can do better by uh, Im improving our sub-Doppler uh, signal. Um, we can also look at the error signal um, of our, our current, um, the noise on our error signal of our, our, our current setup. So here I've just tuned the detuned the DBR laser uh, away from resonance and look at the residual fluctuations on the error signal. Um, and you can uh, convert the, the fluctuations here uh, to a standard deviation and then a frequency. And uh, again, that gives us something on the order of 10 to the minus 9. So th these large fluctuations are what are currently limiting our performance. Uh, and if you actually scan the laser across uh, a, a wide range of detuned uh, frequencies, um, these, these larger uh, modulations here become nice and regular. And so what's likely causing uh, these uh, instabilities is uh, an etalon in our system. And if we remove this etalon, we expect that the, the noise in our system will be down much at these much smaller levels, as you can see, once you go beyond um, the power spectral density of our noise, once you go beyond uh, a few hertz, the, the noise level drops significantly by more than order of magnitude. So we should be able to, uh, once we solve, solve uh, problems of etalons in our system, be able to lock, uh, improve our lock stability by at least an order of magnitude. Um, so with that, I'll conclude. Um, we've uh, designed and demonstrated a photonic chip for uh, stabilizing uh, a laser to a rubidium vapor. Um, the photonic chip's been uh, operating for eight months uh, to date. And um, our current stability is at about 10 to the minus 9 at one second, but we understand what's limiting that, and we should be able to um, do that in, in the future. Um, that I'll uh, put up uh, the contributors again, and thank you for your attention.